for two days, Jesus stayed where he was. He remained in that place and not with his friends. For four days, Lazarus was in the tomb. Twice, John tells us that. What's the significance of these days? Today's gospel is about suffering, love, and power. Suffering, love, power, real power. Let's begin with the two days. Jesus remained where he was for two days. Was it a mistake? No, wasn't a mistake. He makes it very clear at the beginning of the gospel today that this illness that his friend had was not to end in death. And Jesus knew the precise moment when Lazarus died. He told his disciples, our friend Lazarus is asleep. When they don't get it, he tells them clearly, he's dead. It's time to go back. But it is puzzling why he would stay away for two days. He allows Lazarus to suffer. To suffer an illness that while it didn't lead to eternal death, led to his physical death. He allowed Mary and Martha to suffer with their brother. He had the ability, even from a distance, where he was staying, to just say that Lazarus be healed. But he doesn't do this. The puzzling thing is, when we ask the question, why does Jesus stay away for two days, is that the gospel tells us. It tells us that Jesus loved Martha and her sister, Mary, and Lazarus. And so he remained where he was for two days. It's because he loves him that he stays away. That's strange. It's because Jesus doesn't take away our suffering, but he takes away death. It's a difficult mystery. He doesn't prevent Lazarus from suffering. But he calls him forth from the dead. St. John Chrysostom, in a homily about Lazarus, says that many are offended that those who are precious to God would suffer. Maybe we take offense at this. Maybe we take a festival, maybe we see someone suffering terribly, and we think to ourselves, that person is such a good person. How could God let them suffer so much? St. John Chrysostom goes on to say, however, they don't realize that to those who are precious to God, suffering is their lot. It is our lot. Maybe we take offense whenever we find ourselves in a situation of suffering, in a situation of great loss. We take offense at God. God, don't you love me? Don't you care for me? And St. John is saying in today's gospel, yes, I love you. But I'm not going to take away your suffering. But I'm going to give you something that you truly need. I'm going to give you life, eternal life. This is important for us on this fifth Sunday of Lent as we approach Holy Week, as you and I prepare on Good Friday to embrace the cross, a share in the suffering of Christ. 
that we never doubt that he loves us. That we are precious to him. The shortest verse in John's gospel, he wept. Jesus weeps for us when we suffer. Jesus is not saying that suffering is good or death is good. These are evils that came as a result of the fall. But he came to conquer death. And that's what he reveals in today's miracle. Today's gospel is about the power of God's love to give us the fullness of life. It is the fulfillment of our first reading today from Ezekiel chapter 37. We just have three verses from that passage, which in the larger context is speaking about the valley of dry bones. Dry bones. Dem bones, dem bones, dem. Dry bones, dem bones, dem bones. You know the song. What that passage is about is these people are really dead. And yet God is going to open the tombs of these dry bones and bring them back to life. Ezekiel is prophesying about the last day, the resurrection to eternal life. And that's what today's gospel is about also. The power of Jesus, not only to forgive sins, but his power over death. Four days in the tomb. It was understood in Jesus' day that, that the soul would definitely not remain with the body after three days. And so in the Mishnah, the Jewish writings where they codified their law, they acknowledged that you couldn't really recognize a body for legal purposes after three days. The body was, was clearly dead. But not only that, unlike the Egyptians who embalmed their dead, The Jews didn't do this. They buried him immediately. The body immediately began to decompose. They would wrap the body in spices so it wouldn't smell so bad. But the body was in the tomb four days. It's beginning to decompose. It stunk. Jewish practice was to go back to the cave where the body was placed to decompose after a year or two. And they would collect the bones, the dry bones, like in our first reading. They would collect those bones, put them in an ossuary, which is a box for the bones, and then they would bury that. So what we're hearing about in Jesus is the fulfillment of the prophet Ezekiel, a body that stinks, that is truly dead, decomposed, the soul is gone, Lazarus is dead beyond a shadow of doubt. And yet Jesus calls him forth from the tomb. Lazarus, come out. This was a a powerful miracle. We hear in the very next chapter of John's gospel that there was a banquet in Bethesda. In Bethany where Martha and Mary and Lazarus lived. And Jesus was invited to the banquet. And people from Jerusalem came down to the banquet not only to see Jesus but to see Lazarus, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. And just as they were plotting against Jesus, that next chapter of John's Gospel tells us that they began to plot to kill Lazarus because people were coming to believe in Jesus because of this miracle. The miracle of God calling forth the dead from their tomb. The good news this weekend, as we finish our Lenten season and prepare for Holy Week, is to stay focused on the power of Christ to lead us through no matter how dark the moment is, no matter how difficult our struggles are, that He leads us from death to the fullness of life. In our creed every week, we proclaim, I look forward to the resurrection of the dead. I look forward to the 
resurrection of the dead, the redemption of our bodies, life everlasting. May the Lord who loves us help us to place our trust in Him as we pick up our crosses and follow after Him. At this time, I would like to call forth our elect, Christian. If you can bow down your head. Let us pray for our elect whom God has chosen. May the grace of the sacraments conform her to Christ in his passion and resurrection and enable her to triumph over the bitter fate of death. That the faithful strengthen them against worldly deceits and every kind, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That they may always thank God who has chosen to rescue them from their ignorance of eternal life and to set them on a way of salvation let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That the examples and prayers of the catechumens who have shed their blood for Christ may encourage these elect in their hope of eternal life. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Father, source of all life, in giving life to the living, you seek out the image of your glory and in raising the dead, you reveal your unbounded power. Rescue our elect from the tyranny of death, for she longs for the new life through baptism. Free her from the slavery of Satan, the source of sin and death, who seeks to corrupt the world you created and saw to be good. Place her under the reign of your beloved son, that she may share in the power of his resurrection and give witness to your glory before all. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Lord Jesus Christ, you commanded Lazarus to step forth alive from his tomb and by your own resurrection freed all people from death. We pray for this your servant who eagerly approaches the waters of new birth and hungers for the banquet of life. Do not let the power of death hold her back for by her faith she will share in the triumph of your resurrection for you live and reign forever and ever. Kristen, although you cannot yet fully participate in the Lord's Eucharist, stay with us as a sign of our hope that all God's children will eat and drink with the Lord and work with His Spirit to recreate the face of the earth. Amen. Please stand for our profession of the faith. <laughs> 